All right, today we are talking to Mark II again. We talked to you two uh, years ago, and so we're kind of doing a full circle, and we're going to talk about taxes again. Hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to talk about this stuff again. Yeah, I had to uh, look back at our blog, and we saw that, yeah, it's been almost exactly, yeah, it was 2016 that uh, it's, we talked. A lot has happened since then. It's been uh it's been really cool. This, I got a good response after after talking to you guys the first time, and um, I don't know. It's 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 a really awesome community and audience that you guys have, and I'm happy to be back. Now that's interesting to me because you know we you know we do have a uh, a forum where we talk to people who listen to the podcast, and it's you know kind of like a a core group of people. So we never really know like who's out there. So when we talked to you, I felt like you were kind of a little bit like weren't sure about a lot of things at the <laughs> a reselling community. I was asking it, it things and it was more like, that's a good question, you know? And, uh, right. But now it, you've actually uh, written a couple like ebooks where you obviously know a lot more now. Can you kind of talk about that, how it, you've evolved in the past couple of years? Yeah. I mean, about the first, around the time I talked to you guys the first time, I was, I was just starting to get into to reselling a little bit. I mean, I've always sold as a hobby on eBay and stuff. But it's it's at that time I was talking to like a friend who was starting to, to make all this money on Amazon and I was looking into it and then I talked to you guys and I mean I had tax expertise but not necessarily at the whole ton of, of reselling tax expertise. Not that it's it's so far out there and different, but um, but yeah, I mean, I talked to you guys and then I started getting more people even emailing me, asking me questions about, about reselling. And, and I, I just started seeing that all the questions were, were essentially the same. You know, the, the typical thing is, Hey, I'm, I'm, I've been selling on eBay or Amazon or whatever for, <laughs> you know, for a few months yeah. and every, everything's a mess. What should I be doing? Yeah. And I, I was just noticing this pattern and I was like, man, I wish I just had like something I could just send them and give them that had all the answers in it. So, so finally I was like, Hey, why don't and I, I write this this uh, this book. It's an ebook right now, but but yeah, I I finally put together all this stuff. It turned out to be like seventy five pages of of what I have experienced to be the most commonly asked questions about reselling, accounting, and taxes. And I just launched it, you know, for like thirteen bucks, fourteen bucks uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, it's had a really good response. It's it's um, people have really liked it. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I read it, and we'll link to it on the blog. Uh, and it would have been something helpful it's for us when we first uh, started out all the things about cost of goods sold and expenses and how to, you know, should it be a partnership, a sole proprietorship, LLC, all that stuff. So, you know, it's a good kind of uh, way to get started. And I think when we first talked to you, you know, it was like, you know, when we were trying to find an accountant, you know, it's easy to find an accountant that knows tax stuff. It's harder to find an accountant that knows specifically all the things that eBay and Amazon people encounter. Right. And I mean, even if and there are some nuances and it's not it's not so much that that eBay and Amazon is is so different tax wise. But I mean, there is some of that, but it also just helps to have somebody who's like familiar with you know, the eBay platform or like right. the Amazon platform, you know, cause I can help people if, if they don't know how to find a certain report that they need to send me, like I can actually go, you know, I know exactly what to tell them how to get it. You know right. what I mean? Before we kind of get into all the tech stuff, I do want to talk about a couple of things that will help our listeners know your uh, cred, I guess. So number one, you know, we always talk about owning each your own time and having freedom. Are you guys as a family, are you guys actually... I guess you sold your house and moved to Central America. Is that right? Yeah. So um, I I'm coming to you live from Nicaragua today. the The story behind that is, I mean, you know, when I was 19, I lived in Mexico for a couple of years as a missionary, and um, you know, just really fell in love with with Mexico and with Latin America in general. And I I didn't know my wife at the time, but she had done something similar in Argentina. And uh, after we married, it kind of became a shared dream of ours to move the family to Latin America and you know just have a different cultural experience together but it but it was really more of like a you know one of those far out dreams that you never think you'll actually do <laughs> you know and then and then 10 years in about to our marriage you know things just kind of lined up uh job wise and and um we were like hey you know it's it's now or never let's actually do this so and, and i uh, mean and why don't we be clear too if we can say and that's not just the two of you there's 
also a bunch of kids that go along with that package, right? <laughs> there are a bunch of little kids. No, we have we have four kids. Um, our oldest is ten, and then three behind him. So we we uh, packed them all up and, and moved down here about nine months ago, and um, probably have about three months left until we come back. And it's ten years ago, that that kind of thing wasn't all that common, but now there's there's a lot more out there about many retirements and all yeah. this non traditional work paths and stuff, and um, you know just we made it become a reality and where we, you know, if, if I, if we hadn't, it would have been something we would have regretted for the rest of our life. So it's, it's been pretty, uh, yeah, pretty life changing. Right. I mean, there's this idea now, especially among a younger people, this idea, like why wait till we're a 60 to get the RV and travel around the country? You know, let's start doing it now. Yeah. That, that's something I, I had thought before I started reading all the Tim Ferriss books out there or whatever. And I was just, and when I started reading, I was like, this is exactly what I've been saying. And so just real quick, you were able to swing that because uh, you just started a business, right? Or, or continued the uh, business from down there. Is that correct? Tax. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't uh, work full time down here and it, it has been helpful because I do, I continue to run my accounting business down here, but I mean, we prepared for it as if like worst case scenario, like as if we didn't have any income. So we said, okay, how much do we need to save to go live down there for a year? And, you know, in Nicaragua, it's super cheap. It's not, yeah, it's not that much. So, you know, we tried to, we targeted to save $30,000, you know, just in case it's going to turn out that I'm, we're not going to need all that anyway, because I'm, I'm able to continue to do taxes and, and some of this consulting stuff that I do. But, um, yeah, that's how we made it work. Huh. Just saved, made it a goal and saved for it. And here we are. That's awesome. And do, does everyone enjoy it down there? All the kids and the wife and yeah, I mean, it's, it's been awesome. It's, it's really different. There are definitely things we miss from the States, but they're different. It definitely things we're going to miss, uh, about here when we, go back the uh, second thing i want people to know and i don't even really as know this too much so are you a person that sells on amazon and ebay like as a, a job or as like a source of income or is it still a hobby so on for ebay it's more of a hobby uh but i do sell on amazon um as a business i've i've been involved with a like a private label on amazon for about two years now mm-hmm. um i sell through amazon fba right now it's just one product i mean it's since it's fulfilled by amazon i, I don't put a lot of time into it you know in the back of my mind i'm always thinking gosh i gotta get like another product out there i gotta get on this but you know right now it's tax season so and so and so for people that don't know that's just where you like found a product and then you slap a name on it so it's kind of like a private a label that other people can't you know jump in on and then what and then if you have a factory make it and then they send it to amazon and then they yeah sell it for you so it's all kind of like you don't even touch anything right Right. I mean, I'm, I still have the inventory shipped to me just to inspect it. And then I send it to Amazon and, oh, and they're the ones who fulfill it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But that's not very often. Right. I mean, it's just every time I need to replenish inventory. So about taxes, I mean, what percentage of like it's your tax uh, clients are eBay or Amazon people? Um, I'd say, gosh, if I had to put a percentage on, I'd say like 75, 80 percent oh, wow. are, yeah. are resellers. Yeah. And are most of those Amazon, eBay? Is it split? That's a good question. I'd have to look at it, but I feel like most people sell on more than one platform. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot who are just eBay or just Amazon. There's a lot of uh, people who sell on Poshmark. Yep. And then there's there's a lot of little ones that I keep learning about. There's like Tradesy and yeah. Mercari and all these other names that I don't even remember. Yeah, Etsy and uh, Let Go and Offer Up and yeah, all these other little people try and just put their stuff everywhere. So, you know, people who know us, you know, we know we try to do Amazon for about a year or so and it just wasn't really our bag. It wasn't kind of our style. We're more as our podcast is scavengers, you know, kind of a mm-hmm. You know, going after the weird older stuff, uh, that's just more our style. But with Amazon, is it easier to do taxes because it's more like a regular business with invoices and, you know, Amazon really does a good job of giving you all that info of what sells and costs of goods sold and stuff? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the no? case. Uh, no. I mean, it, it depends, but no, I wouldn't say they have like superior reporting or anything. It's still, um, it can be confusing. Yep. It, it it just depends. And what about I, – I have no idea, but you know, if you hear all these things about now all the tax stuff with Amazon where you, you can get charged different states want taxes from you and the a nexus and all that stuff, is that becoming easier or harder? That's a good question. I mean I think that's like a – that's something that just continues to evolve and develop. I mean a lot of people and CPAs just aren't really thinking about it because I – mean, <laughs> 
because it's it's just so complex and it's even it's so complex that the states don't have the resources to even enforce it right so and since that being the case there's people aren't right. aren't worrying about it too much other yeah. than just knowing it's like really confusing right like i guess at some point there'll just be a a national tax i guess that will just get added i don't know yeah they'll eventually come up with something i mean right now i just tell people like the basic of sales tax which is you know charge sales tax to the people who purchase your product in your same state and if they want to worry about where they have like fulfillment warehouses and all that kind of stuff where they have a presence or where they have nexus you know i can help them do that but i don't i don't necessarily say you know, you got to you got to do this. OK, so that's all my Amazon stuff. I, I don't have any more Amazon stuff to ask you. Uh, so let's talk about eBay, because that's what I know. And that's what a lot of people hearing this do. The number one thing that we always get asked is how do you keep track of cost of goods sold? So starting out, I tell people to use a simple spreadsheet that has just five basic things. And, and that would be the item description, your purchase cost, the purchase date, your selling price, and the sale date. And if you keep track of, of those five things, you'll know at any given time what your cost of goods sold is for any period, and you'll know what your current inventory levels are. It's really as simple as that. Right. And it's at some point, a spreadsheet may become unmanageable, you know, if you're continuing to grow and, and list thousands of items. Yeah. And, and that's the point when you can start to consider like paid services like Inventory Lab, which is for Amazon. Right. Or, you know, there are some eBay solutions out there like Easy Auction Tracker or My Cost Pro. Right. Or, or some things like that. Now, I mean, and, and the reason why, in case anyone doesn't know, the reason why it's important to do that is because when you start doing taxes, the big thing is to find deductions. And so you want to see what the cost of the goods sold for that, uh, you know, 12 a month. So it, you can deduct that from your income and then not pay taxes on it. Right. Absolutely. Cost of goods sold is, is often going to be your biggest deduction. So you want to make sure that you um, calculate it correctly and that you deduct it. Definitely. So I hear the eBay people are screaming at me now, you know, okay, that sounds so smart. Just get a, uh, you know, a spreadsheet. So if you go to a, a, a you know, a thrift store, and you buy 10 t-shirts for a dollar each, that's really easy. But what happens like if, if I go to an auction and I buy a table of junk for $10, but there's like 100, 100 items on there, how would you tell someone to deduct cost of goods sold for that? I mean, if like if you buy 100 items for a dollar, it, it seems a little bit excessive to you know list right. the cost of each one of those for a penny. Right. I mean, t- technically, that's what you would do. But honestly, I don't. I don't think the IRS is going to hold. I mean, I'm getting into my opinion here, but like, if it were me, I might just not even worry about it. Yeah, I, I, maybe I would just d- deduct it all right then, even though I don't know if that's technically correct. But I just, when you get to that level of granular detail, I don't think it really matters. Right. I guess. I guess what I'm getting at, and um, I mean, I kind of know the answer that I would say, but you know. When you aren't going to a traditional place where you're getting a, a receipt for each and every item, where you're just buying kind of things in bulk like a, a, a yard sale where you just kind of pile it up and they aren't even handing you any kind of paperwork. I guess what we do is we just do the best that if we can and enter into a spreadsheet hoping that the IRS sees that we're doing our best to keep some track of, of our inventory. Yeah, and that's really the key. I mean, if you can show that you're putting forth a, a good faith effort, is what I usually say, to um, you know maintain your records and, and report your stuff accurately, you're never going to have any trouble. And then the other like big expense would be the uh, it's mileage in a car. That's a big one for eBay people. Yeah, mileage is really big because people are always going on on sourcing trips and things, and it's so it's surprising that a lot of people actually don't even track it or or think to track it um, because that's probably that's a really that can be a really substantial deduction that that adds up. And another thing there is you have the choice to either deduct mileage which in 2018 is 54 and a half cents per mile or your actual like car expenses, like your gas and your repairs and maintenance. So you can't take both. Like if you're deducting your gas, you can't deduct your mileage. Also, you got to choose the one that's better for you. And it's always 
easier to keep track of that stuff as it's happening than obviously at the end of the uh, a year try and make a a mileage list. You know, you know, people either have like a little a notebook or there are you know iPhone apps or Android apps that help you keep track of your a mileage. Yeah, I mean that's that's the easiest way. Like Mile IQ is one. It's super easy. You almost, I mean, it takes like just a couple seconds to to categorize your trips and it's all stored for you. And, you know, like when we first started, I think that first, that first time we realized we had to do taxes for eBay and we were kind of freaking out. We had to kind of make it all up or not make it up, but we had to get all the info and compile it at the end of the uh, year. That was very hard. Now we're smart about it. At the end of every a month, we do all of our a number. So when tax time comes, it's very easy because we've done it all, basically. Yeah, that is. I mean, that's good. That's one thing that that I talk about too. Is you got to establish at least a monthly process so you're on top of it all the time. And then when tax time rolls around, you're you're ready to go. The other thing is like the home office. You know, on our a forum, we kind of we kind of argue about that sometimes about how much of a home office it you can take and is that a red flag for the IRS? I mean, do it you have an opinion on that? Some people, I don't know. There's there's this uh, there's this idea that a home office is a red flag, and um, you know, talking to two older CPAs, some argue that it never was a red flag, and and others say maybe it was, but but if it ever was, you know, it's it's not really any longer. It's not the red flag that it used to be. And um, the thing with the home office is you got to make sure that it's the, it's a space that you use regularly and exclusively. Those are the two keys uh, for your business. Uh, one benefit for resellers is you can also count your storage space. That's that's the exception, I guess, to the regular and exclusive clause. You can you can count whatever space you use for storing your inventory. With the home office, there's a there are two methods you can use. The traditional method is where it it looks at your total home costs and allocates them to sort of your your space that you're using. And the simplified method is uh, it just is solely based on square footage. You get five dollars per square feet four square foot up to 300 square feet. Someone was uh, saying like if they have a mortgage, they just take a a, a, a 10% of that and say that that's it's, it's my cost. Is that correct or could that be correct? Uh, that could be correct, yeah. Really? If you have a 1,000 square foot home and your office space is 100 square feet so that it, it takes that 10% and then it'll take 10% of your utilities, 10% of your mortgage interest, property wow. tax, homeowners insurance. So so the traditional way can, can actually end up being quite a bit more than the uh, simplified method depending on you know how big your house is and all those bills and stuff. Okay. The other thing that I know we were kind of shocked by when we started to work on our own and uh, it's for ourselves is a self-employment tax. Can you explain what self-employment tax and how it's different compared to what people pay as like a W-2 employee, like a person that just has a job? Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I had that experience too. My, the first time I was ever, ever self-employed, like it's, it's almost, I don't know if, I don't know of a case where it hasn't been a shock to somebody where they've, where they've just known about it going in. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's easiest to relate it to a, a traditional W-2 job. I mean, most of us are familiar seeing with familiar with seeing our federal income taxes being withheld, along with Social Security and Medicare. And it's it's that Social Security and Medicare piece, uh, which is seven point six five percent taken out of our checks. But what we don't sometimes realize is that our our employers are paying another seven point six five percent on our behalf. So in total, there's fifteen point three percent tax being paid. And uh, when we're self-employed, we're stuck with that entire amount. So it's it's basically a 15% tax on our profits. And that's on the a gross profit. Is that correct? Uh, no, net? that'll be on, on your net profit. On the net profit. Okay. And that's in addition to regular income tax. Right. So that's what I think uh, really gets people or or uh, surprises people because that's, you know, a big, a big hit. Yeah, it's it's a big chunk. I mean, it's um but also, you know, I guess when you get older, it you'll be happy to pay it off, hopefully. I know some people argue it's whether or not they want to wait for the government to help them or not, but uh I guess that's just a, a way it is, so you have to be prepared for it. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole other other discussion. Yeah, exactly. We also get a lot of it's questions of like, "Oh no, I need to get, you know, I need to do my stuff now. How do I find a good accountant, a tax account? Should they go to like it's one of those places, 
you know, where they have a guy out front that has a big a wig on and he's trying to bring <laughs> you inside. I mean, I think on this one, the, the two biggest things are expertise and fit. You can have someone who has a lot of expertise, but maybe they're not responsive. Maybe they're a little flaky. Maybe they're too expensive, you know. But then on the other side, you can have somebody who you feel like you're a really good fit with, but maybe they have no idea what they're talking about. So right. so those are the two things. Uh, it's kind of a balance. And I mean, I think the best way is just through referrals and doing your research. You know, I've been asked if there's like some master list out there and, you know, there, there's no there's no magic master list that I know of. I mean, there are probably a few. But, yeah, just through referrals, <clears throat> doing some research. And then, I mean, once you find a name or a few names – I would just send them an email or give them a call and then see how responsive they are, see if they're willing to have a consultation, ask them questions, you know, through which you can gauge their expertise and also if you're going to work well together. And I find too, like the kind of big, it's corporate places, those people aren't really a accountants right they're like people that took kind of a quick course just so they could do people's taxes is that right like it's different from getting like an actual accountant who does it full time you know as a job right yeah that could be the case i mean it it depends i think now in in those maybe more corporate settings there are a lot of people who would be they're supervised maybe by someone who's a cpa i forget what the term is but but that's the thing like that's that's how they are allowed to prepare your taxes they do it kind of through the umbrella of, of maybe somebody higher up who who has that uh, authority in the eyes of the IRS. So, yeah, I mean, it, with, with those big companies, you're probably not going to get the attention uh, that you might get otherwise working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, and it'll probably be more expensive too. Yeah, I mean, we found a guy just in our local town, because, you know, every town will have, you know, a handful of accountants that have an office, and, you know, that's what they do. And he didn't know a whole lot about eBay, but the good thing it was – we liked him and he was willing to hear us and see what we had and he kind of uh, learned and uh, he's great that way. So that's why uh, we like him. Right. And I mean it, it It helps me obviously if I say, hey, I you know, I specialize in reselling and, and make people think that nobody else can do it. But the truth is like any, any accountant or, or CPA or um, other tax preparer who's familiar with inventory-based businesses – should be able to do a pretty good job. What – so as an accountant, so if you took on a new client uh, who sold on eBay or Amazon, what would you expect them to bring to you or email you? Like what kind of info do they need to have to do their taxes? For new clients, I mean it's, all, it's always helpful to see a prior year tax return because I can pull a lot of information from there. Um, and then obviously any forms, to tax forms that you get in the mail are helpful. And then as far as the reselling business, it's helpful to see, I mean, if they have some kind of summary of their sales and different types of expenses, that's usually enough to complete most of the return and, and get a good idea of, of the, if there's anything I'm missing. I usually have three or four follow-up questions. So yeah, those, those are the, the top things that I would say. Yeah, I mean, I know like in that little ebook that it you have, it you suggested some sites that help people gather that info. Like we use uh, it's GoDaddy. That's helpful. It's for us because it, we just hook in our PayPal accounts and then it kind of keeps track of all of our shipping costs and inventory costs and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you're using any type of, of bookkeeping software like GoDaddy or QuickBooks or whatever, yeah, definitely um, print out your your year-end summaries, like your, your P&L for the year would be the most helpful thing to give, yeah. I guess I feel comfortable at now because we went through that trial of a fire where we went from, you know, a working from other people and just a W-2 and, you know, they basically take out a bunch of tax and normally at the end of the a year I'll get some cash back because they took out too much tax. But, yeah, it's much – it's different doing it the way it, we're doing it here because really we – other than paying quarterly taxes, I mean, you know, it's not paying taxes out of every paycheck anymore. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a change in mindset that you have to make when you when you make that transition. It can be uh, it can be kind of startling for for people the first time. So, how important is it to pay quarterly as a self employed? I know that it's your uh, supposed to, and if you don't, there is a, a penalty. But the penalty is relatively small and as long as you pay taxes at the end of the uh year it's okay yeah i mean there are a few guidelines like one of the main one is if if you're if you don't anticipate your tax liability to be more than a thousand dollars at the end of the year you don't have to pay that throughout the year you can just pay it at the end 
Um, but I mean, if, if you anticipate it to be more than that, you should be paying it throughout the year quarterly. And, uh, but it, I mean, if you don't, I'd say, I mean, a lot of people don't, the interest and penalties that they charge usually are not significant, right. but I mean, it's, it's so easy to, to do. It's, it sounds like it's going to be complicated because a lot of the, a lot of things with the IRS are, they have a website now and you can just go on and pay with yeah, a like, card or, yeah, you know. is, is like our accountant, he just, uh, he uh, makes us up some envelopes every quarter and you know we just it's mail in it's money every quarter mail in that's another simple way to do it how much does it cost to get taxes it's completed it's by an accountant for a business and personal taxes like i mean i'm sure it it's it can be all kinds of it prices but is there a good set amount that people can expect yeah i mean there is there's a whole spectrum and i've i've taken on clients and, you know, sometimes I can see how much they paid in the prior year. And I mean, like one guy, he didn't even have a very complicated return. And, and his CPA had charged him like $800 for the prior year when, you know, I charged him 200 <laughs> And I mean, so so it is hard. You can you can get some good benchmarks online and you have all different levels of tax preparers. I mean, there are enrolled agents, there are CPAs, there are attorneys, there are supervised preparers. That's the word I was looking for. I'd say like for a basic return, you're probably maybe $200 or so for a CPA. If they if that person has a Schedule C, which is where your your sole proprietor business goes, I'd say you're more in the range of 3 to 500. If you have an LLC or an S corp, maybe 500 to 700, but again, that could be those are those are kind of close to the, the prices I would charge and um, you know, it might be different for somebody else, but I feel like those are are sort of ballpark. Yeah, we I think we pay seven hundred dollars for to do the taxes for our partnership and then for each of our personal since it, we do them separately. So right, and we can uh, write that off as an expense, and it's so I love it because I don't have to get I don't have to do all that paperwork. I've heard some people say, you know, why would I why would I pass a CPL my numbers just so they can type them into a form, you know, when I could, when I, when I could do the same thing. Right. And, and it's a good point. I mean, yeah. if, if that's all your CPA is doing, if they're just doing your data entry, yep. then it's, it might not be worth it. But I mean, that's not, that's not why you hire them. You, you hire them for their expertise and for their experience. And I mean, just like just last week I did a guy's return and he was, he was a new client. The prior year, he had used the simplified method for the home office deduction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a simple thing, but you know, if he hadn't hired somebody, he probably wouldn't have caught it. I was like, hey, you might be able to get more money back if we use the traditional method. Do you want to send me all your, you know, your utility bills and all that stuff? And he's like, sure. So he sent me all of it. And I mean, it turns out it saved him like $3,000. Wow. So, you know, suddenly that $400 that I charged him doesn't seem like very much at all. And I think for us too, we just want a second some other eyes on it, you know, just to make sure we haven't done something that's a red flag to make sure everything looks kosher, you know. It is more expensive in the short term, but I think in the long term, you will definitely get your money's worth. I mean, unless, you know, unless your return is just like one W-2 and that's it, you right. know, maybe, maybe there's not much they can do there, but otherwise it's, I, you can't go that wrong. Well, I think it's also interesting how it, you talked about in the book about there's a difference between tax planning and tax uh, preparation. You know, the, the, the uh, planning bit is when if you get together, it's with an accountant, it's before everything starts and have a strategy and plan things out. That's when he or she can really help make sure you're doing everything correctly to save extra cash, right? Right. I mean, I one way I think of it is preventative maintenance versus corrective maintenance. I mean, because when you're, when you're doing tax preparations, like all the damage is already done. You know, they, they've already made all their potentially bad decisions and you, right. you know, you only have so much power to, to sort of move that stuff around and make it look as good as you can. Whereas with tax planning, I mean, you have, you can make all these changes in advance of, of the coming year, I mean, say, you know, say that, say that change is, you know, making your, your LLC into an S corp, which can, you know, potentially save you thousands of dollars. You're going to save those thousands of dollars this year and every year going forward. So it, it just, they're good decisions that compound year after year. And I mean, that's what a good tax planning will do for you. Yeah. I mean, so anytime we plan on doing something 
in our uh, business, we always will make an appointment is with our accountant just to talk about and see how it you know might affect us. So we just built a kind of a warehouse on our uh, you know uh, it's behind our house to store stuff, and we talk to them about the tax implications of that and what we could uh, write off and all that stuff, and that's very helpful to us. The the amount of tax planning you can do is potentially limited by your your life circumstances. I mean, again, if all you have is one W-2 job, right. there's only so much planning you can, almost so much flexibility that you have. I mean, you can still do it. You can, I mean, you can, uh, you know, you can max out your retirement contributions to reduce your taxable income and, and things like that. So there's, there's different levels of planning you can do within different types of circumstances. Now, in th- that being said, because I'm big into having an accountant. Other people who I know are hearing this, they're like, I can do it all on my own. And they do. And they probably do a great thing. You know, they, they have uh, QuickBooks and they keep track of everything and they do their taxes and they enjoy it. So if you don't have to get an accountant. You can do it on uh, at your own if you're willing to take it all on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I uh, totally advocate getting a professional. But then on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have like an active web presence and you know half the time i won't i won't go out and hire like a a web professional to do my stuff because i'm too stubborn and you know that that uh i don't know if that's always the best but that's just how it is and and i'm i've learned a lot you know if if you decide to do your own taxes you're gonna learn a lot but then on the other hand i'm like this this is not what i'm trying to specialize in so i don't know it's a yeah i know i mean that's the way i see it is that we could do our own taxes i'm sure but the time we have to put into it is time we could put towards other, you know, uh, something else that we actually enjoy. So it's just a choice. Right. Absolutely. More things before we uh, wrap it up here. You know, we get a lot of people, especially, I don't know, like they email us and they're like, they tell us that if we're running a business, we must be an LLC. We must. Because if we're not an LLC, someone can uh, sue us if we sell them a shirt and it kills that person. Uh mm. So can you help me break that down of why that might not be true? Yeah, th- this is where it gets a little beyond my expertise. Okay. I mean if – Get a lawyer, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. But um, I mean, yeah, if, if you do think that there might be any liability issues within your industry or with certain products that you sell, I would definitely consider forming an LLC because that's – it separates your personal assets from your business assets. Kind so then, of yeah. though. I mean kind of. There are <laughs> times when – the LLC doesn't protect you. Anyway, I mean, yeah, so get a lawyer uh, for sure. I just, when people say this hard and fast as rule that just this this LLC thing will definitely protect you no matter what, I don't buy into it. So Right. I mean, it's, it's an additional layer of protection, but it's not going to, I mean, they call it piercing the corporate veil where... You know, if they can prove that actually you're not that separate, like maybe you maybe you're you have an LLC, but you're still mixing your personal funds with your business funds, then they'll point to that and say, look, they're they're actually the same entity, and and maybe under those circumstances they could pierce that corporate veil and and go after all your assets. So, but I mean, as as just a person, let's say I'm just a person that sells on eBay. You know, I go to a thrift store, I buy stuff. You know, I'm making thirty five thousand dollars. You know, do I need to Get an L- LLC. I I personally don't think so. I mean, in, unless you and unless you feel like if you know you're going to keep growing and eventually be pretty big and that you'll form one eventually, you know, my my advice is well, you might as well do it now while you have time and you're not going crazy trying to keep up with your business. But I don't think I don't. I always tell people there's there's no rush to form an LLC. Being a sole proprietorship is just fine. You know, most most businesses in the U.S. are sole proprietors. Yeah. Ships. I mean, again, we're, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I just, when people come to me and they're just starting out and they put all these hurdles in front of them, like I need to first form an LLC, I need to do this, I need to buy all this equipment. And I just tell them, don't make it so complicated when you're just starting out. Like that stuff can happen later on if it really does become, yeah, a big thing, a big engine of income. But until then, just just get started and just keep good uh, records of what you're, you know, is doing online. Yep, I would agree with that. There's, there's no rush. I hear people say, uh, if I make under twenty thousand dollars, I don't actually have to pay taxes because PayPal is not going to tell the IRS. Is that true? That is not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and, and I, I feel like people are starting to 
that's starting to be more well known, but but maybe not because I still do get questions and emails on that. But yeah, that that's just the threshold of whether or not a, a payment processor like PayPal will send you a 1099k right. and send it to the IRS. So then the IRS will know that you made that money. So it's a little harder for maybe the IRS to know, but if they ever did know, then uh, you'd be on the hook for that in the interest and penalties. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, essentially any income you make selling online is, is going to be taxable. Well, how about people that just say, well, you know, it's just a hobby. Like, you know, I, I have a full-time job and then, you know, I fool around and, you know, I'm making $8,000, $9,000. It's just, it's a hobby. No taxes. Yes. So unfortunately, hobby income is also taxable. But the the thing there is, you know, if a lot of people who are selling stuff as a hobby, they're selling it as a loss. So there's not going to be any tax implications on those sales anyway. If if they are selling hobby stuff at a profit, it, it would be taxable like anything else. Right. If you're selling stuff that you bought in a store, you know, like a brand new couch or something, and you sell that because it's old, that's not really taxable because it's, you've uh, lost uh, money on that deal. But if you're going to like an auction or a thrift store and buying stuff for a dollar and selling it for $10, then there's obviously a profit there. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. What about the idea of, and, and I hear this too, they say, well, if I make too much, you know, like I have a job and I'm selling on eBay, but if I make too much, then I'm going to get bumped up into a higher tax a bracket. So I want to actually not make as much. Yeah. And that's something I actually, I mean, that's something that that's like one of my pet peeves and something I talk a little bit it's about crazy. in my, in my book, I say, don't, I don't know how I worded it in the book, but don't, I mean, don't not sell more because you don't want to pay more taxes. I mean, at the end, you're going to make more profit. Right. No, I mean, the, the answer is, is our tax system is a graduated tax a system. So if I right. make, I forgot it's what the uh, levels are, but if I make twenty over $20,000, I'll get charged one, it's percent up to 20,000. Then after 20,000, that's when I'll get charged a higher percent. It's not on everything. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just on the, on the, on those next, on the next level of income. I, I can talk for a while about that. And then the other thing I hear, and I don't hear it quite as often now, but people are like, well, if I go to Goodwill and I buy some sweatshirts and I end up, I don't want to sell them on eBay, I'll just take them and donate them back, but then I'll deduct these sweatshirts as if I bought them a retail and that'll be okay. Does that make sense? You, you can donate your stuff. Well, I mean, people are saying, well, this shirt, you know, this, this, this sweatshirt I bought, I only bought it for a dollar, but if I were to buy it a retail, it's worth actually a hundred dollars. So I'll just deduct a hundred dollars because that's how much it's worth. <laughs> um, no, you, you, if, if you deduct it at all, you can only deduct it for what you bought it for. So it's, it's, it's not going to be any more than that dollar that you spent. And, and that's, that's when it gets down to having uh, good paperwork and all that stuff, because it, you have to actually, uh, it's prove how much things got uh, bought for. Ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. I mean, a lot of people are uh, nervous about getting audited. Yes. So, I mean, one thing is think about the statistics. The, st- in your, the statistics are in your favor. There's probably a less than 1% chance that, that you're going to get audited. And, and even if you are, you know, my, my old bosses tell me that it's nothing like the old days when they would show up at your house and like sit down at your kitchen <laughs> table and say, you know, bring me all your your receipts and stuff like that. Talking to you real mean and grilling you, you know. Exactly. I mean, today it's it's almost all by mail. They'll just send you a letter and say, you know, and ask for documentation, additional documentation with respect to a, a certain deduction that you took. And if you have that documentation, you provide it and that's it. And then if not, then they just send you a bill to pay, right? A minus yeah, and I mean... Well, and even before there, if, if you don't have it, I would say try and recreate it, you know, to the best of your ability and um, and then give them that. And if they take that, then you're good. If not, you know, they might end up partially disallowing or totally disallowing that, that deduction. And that's also why I like having an accountant because of exactly that point is that if we get a letter from the IRS asking about something, I'll give that to my accountant and he'll help me figure out what I need to ascend him in the uh, format it has to it go in. Yeah, it's it's funny cuz I I people forward me those and I actually got one today and I swear people don't <laughs> even read they don't even read them they're just like, "Hey, I got this letter from the IRS. <laughs> what should I do?" But I mean, yeah, there there is some value in that cuz cuz I prepared their tax return and I can look at it and then look at their return and, and I can be like, "Oh, I know exactly what that is." Yep. And I email them back and say, "It's no problem." 
is what you need. See, and that's what I want to hear. You know, it's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, obviously the IRS has done a good, you know, they're, it's it's important that people are scared of them so that people pay their taxes. You know, and, and unfortunately, people don't pay taxes out of you know because they're uh, it's patriots. They do it because they don't just want to be in trouble. Right. Cool. So, are you taking on its new people? Like, if people hear this and they want to contact, you? Um, yeah, I still I still have I'm still in tax preparing mode. I still have space. So yeah, people are free to contact me. I can see if see if I can help them out this season or, or in the future. Cool. Absolutely. My my email, if I can yeah. say that is mark at not your dad And uh yeah, happy to chat with anybody. And on this blog post, uh we will put links to your ebooks and to your email and your uh, website so people can get in touch. So don't think taxes are scary. It's just part of life. And like you said, and I always tell my partner that, if we're paying a lot of taxes, it means it's we're doing really well. Exactly, exactly. And and I mean, and one thing we we didn't touch on at all that I totally spaced is is the you know all the new tax reform that is uh, coming out this year. And I'd say that the biggest thing there, as it applies to resellers, will be the there's a twenty percent deduction on, of your qualified business income that should be a pretty decent benefit to people who have their own business. So, so yeah, so if you have like a partnership or a sole proprietorship or a LLC or S Corp, and tell me if I'm wrong, my gross income is like $100,000. I can immediately take off 20 its percent before I even get into any of her deductions. Is that correct? As far as I know, that's that's the idea. And so that's, that's going to be for 2019. For 2019. It doesn't start Not- for, right. I mean, sorry, for, for 2018. I mean... We don't do that oh, right, right. for our taxes happening right now. We do that for in one a year from now. Is that correct? Right. It'll yeah. apply to 2018. So right. we'll be we'll be dealing with that in 2019. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, if that's true, that's a big deal. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And they're not going to take away any other the deductions that people take, like a mileage or home office or. Um. So so there are some other things. I mean. Like on the personal side, like there there will no longer be personal exemptions, which can hurt people like me with a ton of kids. But then they're doubling the the, the child tax credit, so that sort of offsets it a little bit. But on on the business side, like uh, for for meals, for example, um, the way you can deduct meals through your business is either either through travel or through business entertainment. Like if you if you take you know a partner or a client or an employee to lunch, uh, but the new tax bill totally got rid of the business entertainment uh, deductions. Really? So what what's unclear right now is if the meal deduction through the business entertainment rules remains or not. That's that's one that's that's really unclear and that we're we're still waiting for clarification on. There there are CPAs out there who are saying it's totally gone. Other ones are saying that that no, you can still do meals through business entertainment. So. It's so crazy to me that you know they passed this and no one would still. I mean, even my account, he says I don't even know yet. You know, just wait and you know it'll become clear uh, later on. It's just so strange. Uh, I guess this tax uh, it reform didn't actually make anything easier. It just gives people you know people just don't have to pay as much. Yeah, so that the IRS still has to like actually come out and clarify and update their guidelines and stuff. So we'll just wait and see what happens. Yeah. And and for me, you know, I was at the same time I was like coming out with this ebook. So I was like, ah, what am I supposed, what am I supposed to write for this part? I mean, the cool thing about an ebook is that then you can just keep updating it. You know, just do. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Cool. So uh, you guys are coming back to the states and uh, full time? Just going to come back and buy a house, or you have still have your old house? Uh, we sold our house. We were in Michigan. It's sold and um, still have our, some stuff in storage out there. We're looking to coming back mid-2018. But, uh, the, you know, the the, uh, the scary and sort of exciting thing is we don't we don't know exactly where we're going to be or what we're going to be doing. So it's, you it's all go like... go anywhere. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, we could go anywhere. The, the opportunities are, are endless. Yeah. How, how exciting. Cool. If you got any suggestions, let me know. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it must be very cool and important to have a partner who's on board. You know, I hear from a lot of people they uh, they want to do a lot of things, but they have a partner who's not on board, and that makes it very difficult. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it definitely helps to to have some kind of shared dream or shared goals, and then you can go after them together. 
And one final thing, now that we're talking about having a partner, do are you guys talk about your income and expenses like in detail together? Um, you know, we uh, – so, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean we <laughs> we have sometimes in the past. I mean it's – I mean I like I have a lot of – we have a lot of friends and it's like the budgeting and all that is like the wife's thing. I don't know if, and even though that, I don't know, but that's something I've pretty much always taken care of. My wife doesn't have a whole ton of interest in that She's arena. Like, I don't care. Just take care of it. Yeah. I mean, I'll try to have like, I used to try and have budgeting meetings and stuff and, and, <laughs> and we would talk about it, but it sounds like you guys are just a frugal people. So the budgets aren't really as, as important maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I try and do it on the side, but I don't, I don't always necessarily pull her into it. Yeah. I just, Try and yeah, I mean it. it uh, we 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 specialize. I'll just yeah. say that. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much for uh, talking to us today. I'll definitely, you know, I'll be interested to see if people contact you know at you about this stuff. Help people figure out how to do things right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I can't believe it's been uh, two years already. Two years. Yeah. <laughs> I know. All right, man. So thanks so much. All right. Talk to you later. All right.